Welcome to a very special presentation of the novel A Really Good Day by James Hosek. On its surface, it's a story about a remarkable round of golf. But if you're not a golfer, if you quickly change the channel, if you accidentally come upon a tournament on TV, I encourage you to listen anyway. It's a story about family and friendship. It's a story about redemption and second chances. It's a story about promises made and promises kept. It's a story about once-in-a-lifetime experiences. But most of all, it is one man's love letter to his family. That man was my brother, the author, James Hosek. Aside from being an amazing veterinarian, woodworker, gardener, husband, father, brother, son, and friend, he was a writer. Writers are often told to write what they know. And in this, his first book, he did that in more ways than I can count. It will make you laugh. It will make you cry. And it will make you stand up and cheer. So sit back and enjoy as Jim takes you on a fun, entertaining journey through 18 holes of golf and one man's really good day. Chapter 7 Fifth Hole Scott was up first once again, and once again there was water on the hole. It was like playing in the Everglades. He remembered back to a course he played in Florida that had alligators hanging around the water hazards. At one hole, his cousin Tom was no more than five yards from one of the reptiles that was at least ten feet from nose to tail. Tom was unfazed by the presence of the creature, and Scott had pulled out his camera to snap a shot of Tom hitting the ball with an alligator right behind him. The photo hung in his office above his drafting table. Tom had offered to take a similarly posed shot of Scott in front of the alligator, but Scott refused. It would put too much temptation in front of fate. He didn't remember how he shot that day, but he did lose a lot of balls. The water on this hole was on the left side again, but the fairway was straight, 415 yards to the hole. The water wouldn't come into play unless he hit it short and hooked it. Paul handed him his driver. Scott looked over at the group by the tee and nodded his head. Quack! they all shouted. Scott joined them in laughter. The joke had spread, and Scott was pleased to see that even Jerry had joined in on the effort. The red-jacketed official seemed a little disturbed at the outburst. Quiet on the tee, he insisted. It's okay, Scott said. The red-jacketed man huffed, and Scott placed his ball. He was careful to have the yellow duck logo facing the pin on the green. He wanted the ball to know where it was going. It was an average length par four, but had the advantage of being downhill from the tee, and he hoped he'd get to the green in two this time. It was always easier to rely on having two putts to make par than to always try to sink one putt. There was some sand up near the green, but that wouldn't come into play until the second shot. The green itself was very long from front to back, and the pin was placed up near the front, four yards from one of the traps. They weren't making it very easy for the players today, but why should they? On his first practice swing, he pulled the club back further than usual, and pulled the club around as fast as he could. The club had missed the patch of grass he was aiming at, and he nearly fell over. Paul walked up to him and whispered, What are you doing? Wanted to see if I could get some more meat on the ball. If I can get 280 yards on this one, I'll be just a pitching wedge away, he whispered back. Paul motioned for Scott to step back and made a letter T with his hands in a timeout signal intended for the official, something you don't normally see during a golf tournament. Paul was so used to doing it from coaching Little League and soccer, he didn't give it a second thought. The red-jacketed man returned a confused expression and Paul turned to talk to Scott. You're going to put it in the water back on the fourth hole with a swing like that, he said softly. I've got the swing in me. I'm not even thinking about it. 
I just need a little more speed. Scott, it's not the speed, but how the club face hits the ball. You know that. Just take an easy swing and hit it right in the middle. I know, but trust me, I played baseball and I know the harder you swing, the more you strike out. It's not time to try something new. Use your regular swing. You'll get it out there. It's wide open after the water and it's a big green. Scott thought about it and breathed deeply. I know you're right. I'm starting to think maybe I can finish in the top half today, but I'm not sure my usual game will do it. Scott, you haven't played your usual game all morning. Keep the same swing and stay in the zone. You'll do fine. Don't forget, we're just here to have fun and get in 18 holes on a great course. Okay. Paul smiled and patted Scott's back. Is everything all right? asked the official. Just fine, answered Paul. Play ball? Ellie laughed and quickly stopped when the red-jacketed man looked in her direction. She got her camera ready and started taping. Scott took two more practice swings, this time remembering to just take an easy swing, not trying to kill the ball at all. The club swung straight, and he felt the flow that came with a practiced stroke. No thinking, just motion, fluid and smooth, all the pieces coming together with perfect timing, making it look effortless and beautiful. He stepped up six inches to put his club head behind his ball. He didn't want to kill it. All he saw was the yellow duck for a moment, and then it was gone. The green tee leaning slightly forward. His head followed his upper body to track the ball. He didn't even remember taking the backswing or hearing the ping of the club face striking the ball. He felt like he was out of his body for a few seconds. A smattering of applause brought him back as the ball dropped neatly in the middle of the fairway and rolled up near the 150-yard marker. Once again, he found himself holding his breath, and he let it out, taking a few quick ones to replace the stale air in his lungs. He seemed to stare out at the ball for a long time and smiled. Wow, he thought, that was a great shot. He knew it wasn't a 325-yard drive you might see a pro make, but for him it was really good. Pete managed to put his drive to the right of the fairway, amongst some squat trees that lined the ridge marking the far side of the fourth fairway. Just down the other side were the sand traps that had nearly caught Scott on his last drive. Jerry stood on the tee and threw a ball into the water before even starting. There, he commented, that's out of the way. They all laughed. His tee shot ended up about five yards past Scott's and he beamed coming off the tee. Great drive, Scott said. Jerry nodded in agreement. Thanks, you too. He patted Scott's shoulder, and they walked down the fairway together. Pete was furthest from the green and shot first, chipping the ball left onto the fairway to avoid the low-hanging branches of the trees. He was still behind Scott and Pete, and walked up to his ball for his third shot. My turn for a bad hole he said. It's closer to the hole, Scott pointed out. Pete was slightly confused by the statement, partially because it was obvious, but also he had no idea why Scott had said it. He shrugged it off and pulled out a seven iron. With the power that all self-fulfilling prophecies carried, he plopped the ball pin high into the sand trap to the right of the green. With the hole so close to the sand trap, it would be hard to pop it out and land it close to the pin. He was maybe looking at a six for the hole and wasn't happy at all with the shot. Closer to the hole, teased Jerry, earning him a rotten snarl from Pete. Scott tried not to laugh out loud. He took out his nine iron and carefully lined himself up to land a yard or two to the left of the pin, hopefully safely away from any beach up there. With just one practice swing, he stepped up to the ball and found himself staring straight at the duck, which was pointed directly at the pin again. What were the odds, he thought. While he was thinking about that, his body swung the club, and the ball disappeared once again. He found it high in the sky, 
just to the left of the pin, as he planned. When it came down, it seemed to slide a little to the right, and, with an audible thud, left a black impression on the green, and hopped to within two feet of the hole. Once again, it felt like he was staring at the ball on the green for minutes. There was a stunned silence. No one had expected him to hit the ball that well, despite how great he was playing. No one played this well in an amateur tournament, ever. Nice shot, said Jerry. Five bucks says I can get it closer. It's a bet, answered Scott without thinking. Jerry walked up to his ball with a pitching wedge. He laid his club behind it and took his stance, lightly cradling the club in his gloved left hand. He wrapped his right hand around the shaft of the club, covering the thumb of his left hand. With his customary quick backswing, he popped the ball even higher in the air than Scott had. It landed slightly to the right of the pin and behind it, but then started a little roll backwards, coming within a yard of the hole. From where they stood, they couldn't tell who was closer, but both were in birdie range for sure. Double or nothing, I sink the putt. No way, Scott answered just as quickly as before. Pete was already walking ahead of them with his caddy, headed for the sand trap. As they approached, Pete had a confused look on his face. There was no ball visible in the trap. I saw it go in, said his caddy. I'm sure it didn't bounce out. Nonetheless, they searched the tall rough around the trap and nothing turned up. What do I do? he asked the official. If you can't see it, it's a ball lost in a hazard. You can take a drop in the trap no more than two club lengths from where it entered. No penalty? No penalty, confirmed the red-jacketed man. Pete's caddy handed him another ball, and Pete dropped it. He took his sand wedge and, with an experienced swing, popped it out nicely. The ball rolled within four inches of the hole, but continued until it was three yards past and uphill of the flag. He shook his head, but realized that was the best he could hope for in the situation. Scott and Jerry picked up their balls, marking their positions. Pete swapped the sand wedge for a putter and walked to the other side of the green to read the lay of the turf. He didn't seem to like what he saw and was taking his time. He stood and lined up his putt, tapping it down the gentle slope. The ball passed the hole on the same side his sand shot did, and this time rolled two yards past the hole in the opposite direction. Don't say it, whispered Paul, reading Scott's mind again. Scott wanted to say, closer to the hole, but Paul's advice kept his mouth shut. With more deliberation, Pete lined up his sixth shot and sank the putt with practiced ease. It was obvious that Jerry's ball was a few inches closer than Scott's, but Scott would wait until they finished the hole to pay off. He eyed his putt, and it looked like it should go straight in. He was careful when he replaced his ball marker with the ball to line up the duck so it was facing the hole once again. He kept the backstroke on his practice putts sharp and short, then stepped up to the ball and watched the duck. Once again, it seemed as though his club moved without his knowledge, and the duck was gone again. The beautiful sound of the ball hitting the bottom of the cup caused him to turn his head. Paul was grinning like an idiot, his fist punching the air in delight. Scott had sunk his third birdie in five holes. He couldn't remember the last time he had three birdies in nine holes, let alone three birdies in two pars. Nice putt. Should have taken the bet, Jerry teased. The big man studied his putt carefully. It would take a miracle for him to have a chance at making a showing in the tournament after his thirteen, but he was determined to do his best nonetheless, an attitude that Scott admired. He sank his putt with ease, and Scott grinned with him. Nice bird. Nine to go, added Jerry with a chuckle. Jerry's caddy replaced the flagstick, and as they walked off the green, the man with the walkie-talkie made his report. The boy with the leaderboard was already pulling numbers off, waiting for the report of the second and third place golfers to come in. The person in first place would stay there, 
at least a little while longer. While the others in the growing crowd followed the three golfers to the sixth tee, Ellie hung back. She pulled out her cell phone and pressed the speed dial for Jason Bernard's phone. It's me, she greeted him. Do you know what's happening at the marathon? He thundered. She pulled the phone away from her ear to ease the pain somewhat. No, but... Some high school kid is running away with it, and the story of the year, and I'm stuck here. Well, I think... He cut her off again. Where the heck are you? I want to get our tape of Patterson and get out of here as soon as we can. This day is a disaster. Ellie counted to three and breathed deeply. Usually, people assumed her red hair came with a matching temper. But this Bernard fellow was more than mad enough for both of them. She was glad she wasn't at the clubhouse. That guy I told you about before, the one who started with a couple of lucky shots, he's holding up. On track to smash some tournament records here. What? I thought the worst golfers went off first. They do, but that doesn't mean they're not good. Listen, I've got his every shot on tape, and there's some really good stuff here. They didn't send us to get tape on the 60th ranked player. They want the guy who's going to play in the pro tournament in a couple of weeks, insisted Jason. Are you that stupid? She almost shouted but kept her voice in the inaudible range to those getting ready on the next tee. Are you calling me stupid? You were just complaining about how you were missing a story about some nobody high school runner coming out of nowhere, and we have practically the same thing going on under our noses. Just because you don't think golf is a real sport doesn't mean that 50 million Americans agree with you. Jason was quiet on the other end for a moment or two. All right, you can keep taping him, but you'll be back for Patterson. We should finish up the front nine before he tees off, she assured him. If he flubs up a couple of holes, I'll probably come in sooner. But I don't think that's going to happen. He's having a great day. I'm glad someone is, Jason said before hanging up. She made one more call, then placed her cell phone back in its belt holster. She checked the tape counter and the battery levels, set for the next four holes. Ellie smiled and jogged to catch up to the others. She glanced at her scorecard. Once more, a water hazard would play a role in the hole, and she wanted to be in on the quack. Andrew Patterson watched as Karen walked quickly back towards the clubhouse. Dressed as she was, it was difficult for her to move very fast and he could tell she wanted to. He folded his copy of the contract and slipped it into the breast pocket of his golf shirt under his sweater. He hadn't even swung a club yet today, and things were looking mighty nice. He had been miffed that she had found him during his meditative pre-game ritual. Karen Blakely said the scorekeeper for the big board had seen Andrew heading off this way, and that was how she found him. After she calmed him down and explained her presence there, he had become quite excited. He was going to do a commercial for Callaway Golf. He was already a fan of the Callaway Tour golf balls, and Karen seemed very excited to know he had some of their products in his bag. A raucous noise erupted from the area by the clubhouse. People were cheering and hollering about something. How far away would he have to get for some peace and quiet? If that happened while he was on the tee, he definitely would have a word with the tournament officials. Andrew had been a little confused to hear about this Jake Fisher fellow, another agent, apparently, who wanted to sign Andrew. Well, he had missed his chance, hadn't he? Besides, he had quickly decided he rather liked this Karen Blakely. She seemed to know what she was talking about. Karen was very excited about the possibilities that would present themselves once he won the tournament. She appeared to be the kind of person who understood Andrew and his passions, predilections, and eccentricities. She assured him they were all assets in the marketing world. Andrew could only agree. Joe Calkin slapped Ted on the back as the scorekeeper let the large white three slip into place under the fifth hole for Scott Hanover. I'm going out there. I don't want to miss any of this. 
I'm beginning to think I didn't make such a stupid bet after all. Three birdies in five holes. He's playing like a pro. Well, we've all had good runs, suggested Joe. Ted nodded in agreement. I have to get back to the driving range, he announced as he checked his watch. He pulled a walkie-talkie off its belt clip. The tournament gave me this to help follow the scores on the course. I'd turned this thing on, but I'm afraid it would disturb the golfers practicing, he said. Didn't they give you an ear plug? asked Joe. I don't know. I don't think so, said Ted. He looked over the walkie-talkie. Joe took it from him and found the earphone receptacle. He handed back the walkie-talkie and fished in his pocket for his iPod and held it with his left hand while he unwrapped the headphones with his right and handed them to Ted. These should fit just fine. Ted took them and plugged them into the socket. He placed them over his head and turned on the black box. A smile lit his face. Thanks, Joe. I'll catch you later. He ambled back to the driving range, his left hand coming up absently to rub a spot on his lower back. Joe watched him and reached into the cast to try to reach an itch on his left wrist. Boy, would he be glad to get this thing off. He considered the situation. Two injured golfers were enjoying a vicarious thrill following a low-ranked amateur. It felt good. It was fun and exciting, and who knew how it would end? If only Hanover could beat Patterson, that would be exciting. If only. Patterson's caddy, Eric Peters, was still standing with the other caddies halfway between the clubhouse and the driving range. Their position gave them a perfect view of the ninth green. Golfers would soon be coming down the ninth hole, ready to make the turn onto the back nine. Jake had been watching the caddy surreptitiously. Patterson would have to meet up with him before heading to the practice range. Jake would make his move then. He glanced at the start time listed for Patterson, and then his watch. If Patterson was going to get in a decent warm-up, Jake shouldn't have to wait very long. The morning was beginning to get a little warmer. Jake took off his jacket and slung it over his left shoulder, loosened his tie and brushed futilely at a stain on his shirt. He decided to walk to the driving range and wait there. Eric had said the golfer would warm up before his round. Twenty golfers were lined up striking balls with various clubs. Some had their caddies teeing up the next ball. Others just rolled the ball into place with their club head and swung leisurely at the striped orbs. A sudden rumbling startled him as he watched. A caddy stood over the ball machine holding a dark green plastic basket that was being filled with balls from a large white box set next to a one-story brick building. The caddy took the balls over to a golfer who was doing some stretches at one of the tee boxes. Waiting for a spot? asked an elderly gentleman in a Niagara windbreaker. What, me? asked Jake. No, just killing some time. You here to watch? asked the man. Here to watch one of the players, at any rate, answered Jake. He extended his right hand. Jake Fisher. Ted Lang. You work for the tournament? Jake asked. Yep. Just here to help the golfers with any last-minute adjustments and pointers. Most of the guys here now are serious amateurs. Statistically, one of them has a pretty good chance of winning. They all have handicaps in the single digits. I never really understood the handicap deal, muttered Jake, not thinking about what he said. Ted raised an eyebrow. You're not a golfer? I'm a sports fan. I know a little about most sports, but mostly I know what makes a good sportsman. Interesting, commented Ted. He waited a moment. And what is that? What's what? asked Jake, lost in his surveillance of the golfers practicing. What makes a good sportsman, or should I say athlete? Jake turned his attention to Ted. No, sportsman, there is a difference, said Jake. Ted looked at him inquisitively. Jake often found his theory of the sportsman to bore many people, and had learned not to expound on it if left to his own discretion. 
but he sensed Ted was genuinely interested. An athlete is someone who is very good at the game. They have mastered the techniques and the rules and the strategies and can play at the top of the field with no worry of embarrassing themselves most of the time, he added. Ted chuckled at the qualifier, and so did Jake. So, Tiger Woods is a good athlete. Well, yes, but that's not to say he's not a good sportsman as well. But at times, I think he slips more towards trying to be a better athlete and he loses something. So, how do you define a good sportsman? A sportsman loves his sport. He knows what is needed to be a very good player, but he doesn't necessarily have all the skills. He plays because it's fun. He's not out to beat his opponent, although that is nice. He wants to improve his game and do a little better than the time before. I think I'd have to agree with you on that, said Ted. There are a lot of athletes here, but unfortunately not many sportsmen. They don't seem to make it to this level very often. Well, I think at this level you do see mostly athletes. The ones that are both are the ones that make it to the top. Can't a sportsman who's not a great athlete make it? Not for long. There may be a few good days here and there, and some great shots periodically, but you have to put them together consistently to win. That's true, agreed Ted. But I have seen my share of pro golfers have rotten days. No one's perfect, pointed out Jake. But I also think an average player will have one or two really great rounds in them. Statistically, that is. I mean, a golfer with a handicap of 18 will shoot most of his holes one over par. Some more, some less. The handicap is how much a golfer is expected to shoot over par? Simplistically, yes. It also takes into account the difficulty of the courses. So your 18 handicap is bound to shoot even par as much as he is 36 strokes over par. Again, to put it simply, yes. And if you extrapolate further, he should be able to shoot 18 strokes under par as often as he shoots 54 over par. How often does a golfer shoot 18 under par? Never been done. At least not at the competitive level. I did see a golfer by the name of L. Guyberger shoot a 59 or 13 under par in the second round of the Memphis Classic in 1977. That was before golf equipment was at the level it is now, and you had to really play the course effectively to do that well. He ended up winning the tournament. Wow, commented Jake. For a pro golfer to shoot four rounds in a row under 70 is a pretty difficult accomplishment. So is 59 the record? asked Jake. Yep. Chris Beck tied it in 1991 in Las Vegas. But he didn't win that one. David Duvall did it in 1999 at the Bob Hope tournament in the last round to pull out the win. Pretty exciting. I expect the winner today will have a round around 67 or 68, four or five under par. But there's always a chance, added Jake. That's what I always say. No one thought Duval had a chance, but by the time he hit the fifth hole, you could see it in his eyes. He was in a place few golfers ever find, and he put together 18 great holes. A year later, He's hitting a quintuple bogey on the 17th hole at St. Andrews. Let a sand trap get the better of him. It all balances out. What about this Hanover guy? Last I checked, he was two under par after four holes. Three under after five holes, corrected Ted, tapping his walkie-talkie. Wow, commented Jake. But odds are he'll be over par by the end and finish up near the bottom where he started. Odds are repeated Ted. But the funny thing about odds is even a million to one shot comes in once every million times or so. I guess you're right. I mean, I could be struck by a meteor right now, said Jake as an example. He looked up into the sky and they both laughed. What do you do, Mr. Fisher? It's Jake, and you could say I find sportsmen and sportswomen. I'm a sports agent. Oh, you represent anyone I'd know? Currently, I don't represent anyone. My last client, Jake trailed off. 
he had started to go down too painful a road and needed to stop. Your last client what? prompted Ted. I'd rather not talk about it. They dumped you or something? Jake looked at the older man. He had a confused, inquisitive expression, and Jake felt his emotions flood back. He could do with a shot of tequila right now. Something to numb the pain, to drive back the memories. What was he doing? For the third time today, Jake was tempting his ability to stay sober. He couldn't keep thinking about it like this. He had to keep his brain focused. Hey, Ted said apologizing. I didn't mean to offend you. It's okay, said Jake. A kid was injured because I let him attempt a stunt that was too dangerous. I paid for it with my career and my sanity and my sobriety. He couldn't believe he was telling this stranger this. He didn't care about Jake's problems. Brad Finley? asked Ted. The sound of Brad's name shocked Jake. How did Ted know about Brad? Had Jake mentioned the name? He asked. How did you... My grandson rollerblades. He mentioned the story to me last Christmas. I didn't know Brad Finley was your client. The name just popped into my head. But as I recall, it was an accident. I should have known it was too much for him. Those skateboarders take lots of risks. He and his parents were counting on me to make sure they were acceptable risks. And they sure didn't think he'd end up paralyzed at the end of the day. So you drank? Yeah, answered Jake. As he looked at Ted, the old man smiled and shook his head. His expression held sympathy, but empathy as well. I wrecked my back five years ago. Drank for four years after that. I told myself if I couldn't golf, what was the point? You don't drink now? One day at a time. Well... I'm still working on the first day. Jake, remember what I said about odds? What do you think the odds were that Brad Finley was going to get hurt doing that stunt? Looking back as objectively as you can. I guess it's that one in a million range. He could have been struck by a meteor. Would that have been your fault? No, but I have no control over that. I did have control over where the commercial was shot and whether or not I thought my client was in condition to attempt it. Then you must have thought it was safe, or he wouldn't have attempted it, right? I should have watched out for him. He was just a kid. A fifteen-year-old boy, Ted. The odds are funny, Jake. Like I said, even the one in a million comes every once in a while. And I should be due for a one in a million in my favor. Maybe I should go out and get some lottery tickets. Maybe. But if you go back to doing what you did best, there's always a chance you'll come out a winner. Yeah, I think my girlfriend believes that too. I bet a lot of people have faith in you, Jake. Give them a chance to be right. Jake stood silent for a moment. The plink of golf balls re-entered his awareness and a murmur of voices crept into the world that seemed to be lost during his conversation. Maybe Andrew Patterson will come through for me. Patterson? laughed Ted. What's wrong? Jake, he's not your sportsman. Yes, he's a good golfer, but he'll never take the risks it takes to break out of the statistical bell curve. Well, he's all I got today. Keep looking up suggested Ted. Jake was confused for a moment, then remembered his reference to being struck by a meteorite and chuckled. I will. And Jake, with regards to one day at a time, call me if you feel the days are getting a little too tough. Ted pulled out his wallet, extracted a business card, and wrote a number on the back. That's my home number. If I'm not there, my wife will know where I am. It'll be another lifeline for you. Ted, said Jake, taking the card, extending his right hand again. It's been a pleasure meeting you. I'll see you around, Jake. When I'm done here, I plan on walking the course a little. Thanks for the information and the advice, said Jake, 
shaking Ted's hand. What were the odds he'd meet someone like Ted Lang here today? It boggled the mind. Jake started walking toward the clubhouse, scanning the area for a violent combination of colors and fashions that might be the start to something better. Thank you for listening to A Really Good Day, a novel by James Hosek, narrated by Rich Hosek. If you're interested in purchasing a hardcover edition of this story for yourself or a golfer in your life, visit jimbooks.myshopify.com. You'll get free shipping in the United States. You'll also get the complete audiobook and ebook editions with your purchase. And make sure to subscribe to the mailing list for updates about the upcoming release of his Doctor at Mystery series, Cozy Mysteries About a Crime-Solving Veterinarian. Thanks again, and all the very best.